we are live. All right, well, good afternoon. My name is Delilah. I'm with a company called Fortuna, and I work um, with entrepreneurs on getting them ready for raising capital. I specifically do a lot of work with women entrepreneurs, although I do work with men too, um, and I have a new, some new programs around that. So today I'm gonna to talk about two things. Uh, my top, my savvy six top six things to get investor ready, and then what's in the deck. So the top slides that need to be in every deck. So let's get started on the savvy six to get investor ready. So the first one is knowing your why. And this is really important when you are obviously starting your business, as we all know how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur and statistically the chances of success. So it's really important to get clear on why you're building this business. What's motivating you? Is it because you want to build a lifestyle company? You want to create something that makes a lot of money, you want to build something that you need to bring into the, into the world that you're very passionate about, you want to change the world. Whatever it is, the reason why it's important to be clear on your why, there's two big reasons. One, it'll keep you motivated when the times get super tough. And let's be honest, that's going to happen. And then the second thing is that make sure that you are aligned with your investors. So whether your investors are people loaning you money through debt or they're angel investors or VCs, Every investor has their motivation of why they want to be part of your startup and why they want to invest. And that is not necessarily in alignment with yours. And so it's really critical that when you're talking to investors, you're clear on your why, you understand what their motivation is and that that should be aligned. Because the one thing we know for sure is if you take money from the wrong investors, it never ends well. And it is a lot of headache later, so just be really, clear on trusting your gut, and that all comes down to being clear on what is your why. So the second one is getting your business house in order. Before you even think about taking on external capital, it's really important to make sure that your business is actually ready. So how is your business need to be ready? One, the company set up. Is it need to be an LLC or a C-Corp, an S-Corp? So for example, if you're taking institutional money like venture capital, they require you to be a C-Corp or an S-Corp. And so just having that all set up and having it properly documented. And it's really important with all these sort of legal areas that you, in my mind, this is where you don't cheap out on, right? So a lot of people, it's, it can be very expensive, especially when it comes to securities lawyers, but there's certain things you wanna have a solid foundation on that you aren't going to like legal zoom and just like copying and pasting uh, from the internet because this is really messy if it's not done properly for later. And again, this stuff will all have to be clean when you're taking on external investors. So legal agreements, super key. If you have co-founders, and make sure it's not just been, hey, me and my friend are starting this business, but we have no actual legal agreement about who has what, what happens when there's conflict, what happens when one person's out. All this stuff has to be documented. Investors are gonna to wanna to see that. Same thing with employees. Do you have employee contracts? Do you have consulting contracts? As most people are probably being outsourced as a 1099, so making sure you have proper documentation around that. And if you have taken on any, many, any money to date, so whether it's your mom or your cousin gave you money, that you have a proper agreement, again, that says exactly who has what in the business. Your IP, so this is really important. Investors wanna know that you have your intellectual property you know, solid because they're investing in the assets of the business of which intellectual property is an asset. So whether that's trademarks or patents, it's really important that if you have the opportunity to have this stuff, you know, if you have a name, your, your website, etc., that these things are properly um, uh, taken care of. Accounting systems that you are properly tracking your inputs and outputs, outputs from a, a financial point of view. If you obviously have, you have a separate bank account for your business that doesn't intermingle with your personal bank account, which as startup entrepreneurs, we've all done that. Um, that needs to be clean and very separate. And then of course, this, uh, this elusive um, thing called a cap table, which really is just a, a document usually prepared by your securities lawyer that says, who owns what in the business. So if you're a C-Corp, it lists the number of shares in the business and then the, who owns what percentage. And so if it's just you, then it's just you, the number of shares and 100%. But as you add investors, the cap table needs to be very, very clean. Okay, number three is how much, for what, and for how long. So this is all about the money. So it's obviously to get investor ready, you have to know 
how much do you need? <laughs> and that comes from your financial model. Now, there's always a big debate about this for, depending on the stage of your business, is if you should have a financial model or not. Now, a financial model, I'm not saying go spend $10,000 and get some fancy CFO to do it for you, but the reality is if you don't have just the basic of a financial model, which, which has, again, the basic sort of assumptions around <coughs> what the costs of the business are going to be and then how you and then what the, you know projections on revenue are it's really hard to know how much you need i mean in a very sophisticated financial model it's the cash flow statement that tells you exactly how much you need and when you're going to run out of money but when you're starting out even if it's just a simple of um you know a simple spreadsheet of we're going to this year we're going to focus on these 10 things to build the business in terms of hard costs, uh, if you're doing a consumer product, the cost of goods, and then of course your customer acquisition costs, that you're being reasonable around that, and what's gonna drive you to get to revenue, and some realistic assumptions around that. So really important to have some sort of idea of a financial model in terms of how much do you need, which of course goes back to why do you need it. So this is what the, it's called the use of proceeds that you'll hear in every pitch deck and every investor conversation. What's the use of proceeds? That just means what do you need the money for? What are you gonna spend it on? So again, nobody expects super details at this point when you have no history of these costs, but definitely what the buckets are. And you know, typical buckets are you know, technology development, um, people obviously, you know, whether it's developers or marketing people, um, co you know, customer acquisition costs like Facebook ads or, or that kind of stuff. So why do you need the money? And then that is listed in your use of proceeds. When do you need it? So, and do you need it all at once? So you can, you, there's often an opportunity to do it in tranches. So if you need, you know for the next 12 months you need $500,000, you need all of it up, up front, can you take it in tranches? Can you meet milestones? So really it's figuring out and communicating with potential investors, this is when we need it, and then and, and in the next one, how long it's going to last which is something called the run rate. So there are all these terms that you hear in investing and the run rate is one of them. And that simply means how long is the money going to last? So if you're talking to investors, you say we're raising 500,000 and our run rate is 12 months. So that money will run out at the end of 12 months. So either at that point, the milestone is we're either going to, in terms of what you get to, it's either going to get to traction, certain number of users, certain number of customers, it's gonna to get to revenue, it's gonna to get to profitability, so a typical thing you would say here to investor is, you know, we, we're raising 500,000, we have a run rate of 12 months, it's gonna get us to our first revenue, or it's gonna get us to our first, our, our, to, to our milestone of 10,000 users, which we know is the only way that we can now get interest from VCs, for example, or the next round of capital. So these are just some very, very basic numbers uh, and things you need to know when you are um, looking at talking to investors. Make sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay, one of my favorites, create your investor avatar. And this goes back to what I was talking about earlier about your why. So you have the opportunity to decide, you know, who is your ideal investor? And I call it the investor avatar. What investor is going to be the right fit for you? So when you're looking at different sources of capital, and the good news today is that there are all kinds of capital, uh, <laughs> angels, VCs, crowdfunding, which are rewards-based crowdfunding, or equity crowdfunding, there's peer-to-peer -peer lending, there's and especially for women, there's all kinds of new funds coming on, on, on um, that are being developed all the time that are tailored to women. So you, you have to decide at the beginning, who is your ideal investor? What is the right fit? And I always, I, I talk about it in what I call the Fortuna funding filters, which is, you know, investors that are, um, that make sense in terms of what they bring for the, besides the money, right? So are they bringing contacts, industry knowledge, support? So you want to think about, in terms of your filters, of what money is realistic for you to get at your stage and the kind of company that you're building, and then what is desirable, because those often aren't the same, right? So again, you know, when you start your funding journey, you want to have, you want to be very clear on on the the best investor for you that's going to make sense for you, right? Are their motivations aligned with with yours, right? We talked about that earlier. And it's really important to consider your long-term funding needs. So the capital you raise today will impact the kind of money that you can raise next time, right? So you're always gonna be thinking longer term about raising capital. That's not going to um, be an issue to raise money later. 
We might have uh, another gentleman sit in okay. in a few minutes. That's fine. I realized he dropped by just randomly to check out the space. Okay. And he said they're about to start funding for oh. a product that they're trying <laughs> to launch. And one of the things you said, I was like, he should be in here. Yeah, totally. So That's he might cool. come, okay. come in. Otherwise, I told him to watch the video once we post it. Yeah. So the next one, number five, is know your numbers. And again, this is like this... You hear this in these, you know, events and at, uh, you know, talk, listening to VCs. Know your numbers. It's like, what are these numbers, right? These magical numbers. So there, are, the the thing is that for every industry, there are key performance metrics, or sometimes they call them uh, KPIs, that are specific to your industry, and you have to know what those are. Otherwise, you will look foolish when talking to investors who do know your business, right? So things like, obviously, what is your burn rate? This is just how much you're spending every month. So you have you cover your monthly cost. MRR or ARR, so monthly or annual recurring revenue. Um, again, you'll often hear people throw out, okay, what's your MRR? And you're like, I don't even know what that means, right? <laughs> it just means monthly recurring revenue, um, which is a very important number to know, right? Um, conversion rates and customer acquisition costs. So super important, especially if you're building, and today a lot of people are building online businesses, e-commerce platforms, et cetera. Every industry has, has conversion rate norms. So for example, if, you're, if you have an e-commerce site, then everybody knows, if they've done the research, or certainly investors, that driving traffic to your website and the conversion rate to, buy, to, to people buying your product is, depending on, on the type of business, is three to five percent. So if you build a financial model and say, hey, 50% of the people that are coming to my website are gonna buy from us, and this is the magic hockey <laughs> stick of my they financial projections, lying. they well, they don't know your line, that they think that you don't know what you're doing or <laughs> talking about, because that number is insane. Nobody has 50% conversion rates off a website, right? The point is, whatever your business is, whatever your industry is, the same thing with, you know, if you have a consumer product, you have to know your margins, right? From the cost of goods, your gross profit, your gross margins, um, before other expenses. These are things you have to be able to rattle off because you'll you'll do a pitch and say, "What are your margins? You know, what's your conversion rate? You know, if you have an if you have an app, right? This is a big one, and then people get really caught up in what are called vanity metrics. So, um, let's say you have an app, and your revenue model is in-app uh, purchases. And so you, on your financial model, you're saying that, you know, we have a thousand people downloaded uh, our app and 10% are going to buy, are going to do an in-app purchase. And then that spits out your revenue number. But what you're not taking into consideration is that, again, what everybody knows is that the number of people who download your app versus actually use your app mm -hmm. are radically different numbers. I think that, that the percentage of people who use an app after it's downloaded is like, is under 10%. So you just went from like a thousand people that you're saying are your potential customers when really it's only a hundred. And if you're saying that you're doing a conversion rate of 10% of people are going to buy, that's the difference of a hundred people buying and one person buying. So, or 10 people buying. So again, this, all the, all this matters is that you have to know for your business, the numbers that are relevant to your business and, 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 and people say, well, how do I find that out? I was just about you, to ask this. You have to do like the, the the horrible grunt work that is included being, being part analytics. of an entrepreneur. You Google it. You talk to people who have similar companies like you. You you can usually find you know pitch decks online now of companies kind of similar to yours. Um, you can go to like things like PitchBook or TechCrunch. But regardless, you have to know the number specific to you. Same thing with customer acquisition costs. This is huge because there is this illusion that if you know, you have, let's say, an online platform and you're just going to do free social media and you're going to drive so much traffic to your site, it's going to be free. So marketing is free, right? There's this concept now that the, the, the barriers to entry of starting a business are lower than they've ever been, which is true. But there's an illusion that acquiring customers is really easy and cheap. And it's just not. So if in your business plan and in your use of proceeds, you're, you're, you have very little money to let's say like getting people off of social media without paid advertising. Everybody knows now that just because you put a post on Facebook, hardly anybody is seeing it. It doesn't go to hardly anyone's feed. So again, if you are building your financial model and your assumptions on how you're driving traffic to your website that will eventually convert, but your first assumption is completely way off, thinking that you're not gonna have to spend a lot of money on customer acquisition, 
again, the investor will think that you don't know what you're doing with your in your business. So really critical to to be very clear about this and be realistic about it as well. And number six is obviously craft your pitch. So there's this really um, you know interesting you know balance between telling your story in a really authentic way to you, because especially at the early stage, the investor is investing in you. So there's always this debate about when you go up and you pitch, like show your personality, not show your personality, be more aggressive than normal, not be. The point, at the end of the day, they're buying you, especially at the beginning, because you know the likelihood of you pivoting your business is high. So they're really investing in you, They want, and so they want to see you and who you are, right? So. You need to be authentic, but then you also still need to address the key points that every investor needs to see in their, uh, or that they want to know about your business. So this is real balance, and and the pitch deck, which again is an ongoing you know development process, it's literally never ending uh, because everyone will tell you something different about how good or bad your pitch is. But it's really important that you can tell your story in an authentic way. Um, but also, as I say, addresses the key points. So really important, obviously, the most important thing is that it clearly articulates your business model. Like, how are you going to make money? And I'm going to get into this as we go through the actual um, slide, uh, uh, the slides in the deck in a second. But a lot of decks never get to either the business model properly that they can actually clearly articulate. That's not some complicated thing. And then they never actually make the ask for the money, right? Uh, so I've been to many pitch competitions. I've seen many people, even just like in a fast pitch, get up. And this happened just a, a few nights ago where people were just getting up very quickly doing their, their one-minute pitch. And then they don't ask for the money, which is the only point of pitching, right? So make the ask. And then my, my bonus uh, in terms of my Savvy 6 is uh, know your power success tools. So we all know that being an entrepreneur is really hard. So, and there's some days you're going to get out, don't want to get out of bed because it's just, it's overwhelming. You don't know what to do or things are going wrong. So it's really important. This is especially true when you start the funding process because you have to be ready for a lot of rejection, a lot of no's, a lot of like not so nice people who will treat you not so nice, especially if you're a woman or if you're a minority, this happens is even harder for us. Um, is that you have to make sure that you have your power tools to get you through the day. So whether that is your stress relievers and if it's meditation or yoga or nature or kickboxing or whatever it is, you need some sort of an outlet to, to, for stress relief. So important to take care of yourself with you know, healthy diet and exercise. And people don't talk about this enough in the entrepreneur world. It's starting to be talked about a lot more because there's been a lot more um, emphasis on you know the burnout in entrepreneurship, the suicides that happened in entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley, et cetera. And so it's really important that you're taking care of yourself to get through this. And then what I have to say is um, uh, team you. So whether it's, you know if, we, if your partner is at home, make sure that they understand what they're about to go through because you are gonna turn into a crazy person uh, and emotional and exhausted and they might not recognize you <laughs> and they need to support you, uh, your friends, having a mentor, having coaches. I mean, this is a stuff that never gets talked about at like VC conferences, but this is so critical that you have this to get through any kind of funding. And, and, and especially again with the percentage of rejection, because the reality is it's like magic when you actually can find an investor. It's like getting married. It's like finding that one person or that in this case, hopefully more than one investor, but it's, you will talk to potentially many, 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 many people. You will pitch a hundred times and you will have to be okay personally with your self-confidence of hearing no. And for a lot of people, and this is really especially true for women, asking for money is already hard. Sitting across the table and asking somebody usually, you know, older white guy for money is really unnatural and uncomfortable. So how do you get past that? You have to just, it all comes down to self-confidence and also just being, you know, just not being naive and just realizing that if someone says no, there's nothing personal about that. It's just not a fit. Yeah. So let that go and move on to the next person because somebody will become a fit. Unless you have a terrible idea and then nobody will be. <laughs> none of this accounts then for- Then just stop everything. Yeah, none of this accounts for if you have a terrible idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Okay, so that's my Savvy 6. So now we're just going to run through um, the top slides that need to be in every deck. So this is, you know, crafting your pitch and um, what, are the, what, are the, what are the slides? So obviously the first one, your first slide is your, you know, is your elevator pitch and you want to capture them really early. So it's when you first stand up, whether you're, you know, you're, you're in a pitch competition, you're in a boardroom with VCs, you're at a coffee, meeting with a potential angel investor, um, you know, that first line that hooks them in, that's like, ooh, this is interesting, right? And so whatever that is, and again, there, there's many ways to do this. Sometimes it's about the product is so cool and unique that it's like, oh, you know, Airbnb for dogs. Oh, wow, that sounds like totally cool. I totally get both of those. Let's, let's see what this is about. Um, but something unique, uh, it could be about your story that, you know, when I was 10, this happened to me and it drove me to do this. Like something that's going to capture them because especially um, in investors like angels or VCs who hear thousands of pitches, you know, how are you going to stand out, right? So that first line is so important. Then, of course, you need to immediately get into what problem we are solving. And the challenge with a lot of you know people doing pitching their stories is that you get wrapped up in the technology or the product or even the customer, but you need to get really be able to articulate super clear what is the actual <coughs> problem that you are solving. What well, is there a problem that you're solving? We've all heard like these companies where you're like, is this even a problem for anybody, right? And and they don't get funded, right? And so, <laughs> what what problem are you actually solving? And then, of course, is that, that another grunt work to actually find the information about there well, though, are they, these they, people that have this issue? And this, well, yeah, in terms of the size of the market, it. yes. But the actual problem should be pretty obvious, otherwise, because that's probably why you started the business, right? You you mm -hmm. saw uh, a, a gap or something you wish you had. I mean, a lot of this is a start to be like, oh, I wish I had this. Oh, I'll just start that business then because it doesn't exist, right? So. But being just, it's just being really clear on like what the problem you're solving is because we've all again seen a lot of this stuff. You know, like what is the actual problem here? Like a lot of the social media stuff. You know, some of the stuff that didn't work out is like this isn't really a problem for anybody, right? So and then it doesn't work, right? Okay. And then obviously, then the next one is you know solutions. So what need within this problem are you really tapping into? And the, the solution or the need could be that it's an established industry, but it's cheaper, it's more efficient, or it just doesn't exist. So there's different ways that the solution can be, rep it can be presented. Um, but again, being, the whole point of all these is that you can clearly articulate so people aren't wondering, what is this? And mm -hmm. who cares about this? And if, so if you lose them right at the beginning of that, then you know, it's, you've lost them. And you're done. So again, it's all about clear articulation, like really spending the time to think about it. And then, then the market size one, which we're just talking about, is how many people actually care about this problem, right? So if it's 10 people, then you don't have a marketplace. If it's a billion people or a million people, and again, depending on the kind of business you're building, um, then, th then this matters. And this slide, the market slide, market size slide, will be often the slide that determines whether or not you can get the interest of the investor in the room. And, and so obviously there's a big thing around being the next unicorn and that everybody has to have a billion dollar marketplace on their slide if you're going after venture capital, which is true, because they have to, they have to see that you can scale this to a certain size for them to make enough money. For them to justify investing their their investors' money into your business, if you're talking to an angel investor um, and you don't need to raise big money longer term, then you know the marketplace can be smaller. So again, this all goes back to the why and what you're building. And there's no shame in building a business that is not a billion dollar business or the next unicorn. Like we need to get out of that mindset that it's only worth starting a business if it's like this craze, like the next Uber. The reality is, again, unicorn, right? <laughs> One out of a millions of businesses and 99.9% .9 of businesses that are built are never going to be that and shouldn't be trying to be that. So it's fine if you're building a smaller business. Like this, there's no shame building a $5 million business that takes care of you and your business and employs a bunch of people and has sustainability for the long term and that you don't want to exit, right? But then again, if that's true, then there are certain investors that won't be applicable to you, which is totally fine, right? Then you just don't waste time going after those money, right? I For see, market yep. size, is that, and this might be a silly question, but is that the same size as 
potential clients or yeah. because the way you phrase it of how many people care about this problem is that something that you want to talk about like these people might be interested in investing in it and these people might be interested in using it or is it just these are our potential this client base and customer yeah. base okay. this is like market sizes you know so let's say you're building whatever kind of a new bicycle widget and it's a two billion dollar business the the, the the bikes accessory business let's say is a two billion dollar industry that means that mm -hmm last year or projected this year that the amount of money spent on bike accessories was two billion dollars right okay. so it's, it's so so then the investor goes okay we can capture a percentage of that that's a lot of money we're good or if it's like oh it's a 10 million dollar industry then we, you can only capture so much of that yeah um, marketplace realistically and so is this is this a viable business or is it just a small business which is fine and then just the investors will be, you know, relevant or not. Okay. Okay, so next is obviously competition. So who is competing for your customer's money? And this is, you know, people always think about this as like, oh, there's no direct competitors. But you have to also think about indirect competitors. So your customer, whether it's a business if you have a B2B business or, uh, you know, consumers if you have a B2C uh, business model, your customer has so much money in their wallet, right? And whatever percentage or portion that they spend on your industry or genre, or whatever you're talking about, whether you're spending it with a <coughs> direct competitor or an indirect competitor, you're still trying to get that same money, right? From, from, from that business or from that consumer. So being really clear, because a lot of people say, well, we have no competitor and we have no competition because we're creating something new, but you're still competing for a finite bit of money that your customer has. So they're spending that money on something else then that you're gonna to have to convince them to spend it over here, right? So every corporation has a budget, every person has a personal budget, they only have so much money, so you're trying to get some of that money away from them, so they're spending it somewhere else now. So it's really, how are you taking that money away from your, from your either direct or indirect competitors? So then technically, wouldn't that be everything is your indirect competitor because they're well, gonna no, like, spend your money? In but like within a genre, right? Like, okay. like, like let's say, like so if you're in entertainment, you're yes, competing exactly. against yeah. it. Yeah, okay. yeah. So whether you are creating a new movie or a new music or a new, you know, writing thing outside, you know, everyone has like an entertainment budget, let's yeah. say, and okay. so or a health budget or whatever, or a social activity budget, whatever it is. So whether or not no one else has this special spa like you do, they're spending money, that money, somewhere else. And now you're going to have to convince them to spend it over here. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, what is your edge? And, again, depending on the kind of money you're going after, it has to be a big, unfair advantage. So, really, how are you not just different and better, but, like, significantly different and better? And, again, this could be you're competing on price, you're competing on features, you're competing on efficiency, you're, you're competing on coolness, like, whatever it is, there has to be a big, unfair advantage to that. And then what I was talking about earlier, the business model. So, so important in this, probably the most important in the deck is how are you actually going to make money? Now, obviously there are some business models where their whole business model, like, you know, if you remember like Instagram or the, you know, Snapchat or whatever before, like before Instagram was bought, their whole business model was just get users, right? Because then that was going to translate into them getting bought. Um, but generally speaking, is how are you actually going to make money and be very clearly able to articulate that. Again, is it a B2B business model? Is it a B2C business model? Is it a hybrid? Where is the money actually going to come from? And then your projections. So what are the revenue potential and KPIs? So key performance indicators. So again, like we had talked about earlier, is knowing your numbers. And again, this is always a tough slide on, you know, for revenue when you're first starting out. The key to all this, again, with anything financially related, especially the early stage, is that the investors, they realize that all these numbers at the beginning are nonsense. Like, you know, everybody has these projections. Everybody knows that they're nonsense. You don't really know. Yeah, and nobody knows. And you probably don't even know what your business model potentially has been going to be, but you're going to take a stab at it at the beginning. But the key is that the investors want to see that you understand the inputs that go into the revenue model and the, and the financial model and that they're reasonable. Again, we we're talking earlier about that you're making your assumptions on how to acquire, quest, how to acquire customers, how much they're going to pay you. And so that is the inputs of the model that are more important than the actual numbers that get put out, right? 
because they again they just want to know that you understand your business and what the input should be for your business and then obviously your customers and now there's two in this terms of marketing there's two ways to think about this that people don't often don't realize the nuance of different the difference how are you going to get to the customers and then how are you going to acquire them so how you're getting to the customers, right? So let's say, again, you have an e-commerce platform. How are you going to get to them? We're going to do social media. We're going to do Facebook ads. We're going to do some guerrilla marketing outside of our office wearing a gorilla suit, like whatever it is, right? How are you going to get the customers to you, whether that's to your physical shop or your website or whatever it is? And then once they're there, how are you going to acquire them? So is it going to be because of pricing, user experience on your website, you know, celebrity endorsement on it, like whatever it is, is but again, you see the nuance between the two different things of bringing them in and then actually converting them, right, to, to customers. So the first one is getting the traffic to, again, whether it's your, let's say you have a physical store or it's your website, and the second thing is once they're there, how do you convert them into paying customers? Do you have a loyalty program? Do you have a two-for-one deal? Do you have a uh, one from one model like Tom shoes so that you know once they come and they say oh my god this is amazing or you know you have an artisan site that shows the women in Kenya who are making the product and that's what's going to make people buy right or a percentage of your you know your revenue is going to go to a charity like those are all like how are you acquiring them right so two just kind of different ways to think about getting your customers and then the team is who do you have and who do you need so obviously this is a tough one. This this is the toughest slide when it's just you because it's just like your head on the slide. <laughs> so just like your picture, hi. <laughs> this is the whole team, it's me. So how do you how do you make that look more robust? Obviously, the first thing you can do is get a couple of advisors, right? So at least if it's your head and a couple of advisors' heads, and it looks like more of a team. And again, the whole the whole point when you're starting out um, early stage is the investors want to know that you have the ability to attract people into your business, right? So whether it's an advisor who's a super smart, you know, um, successful person that's actually giving you their time is a big deal, right? And that they're willing to be on your slide deck, right? Yeah. Uh, whether it's you've convinced people to work for sweat equity, big deal. So. The point is with anything like this, and especially the teams that you have, your idea is so awesome and cool, and you are so awesome and cool, that people want to give you time or work for less or whatever, right? That's what you need to communicate on the team slide. And then obviously, I would assume that some of your use of proceeds is going to go to hiring more people. Who is it? And you don't have to put them on the slide, but just say, again, you know your business, you know to get to your next milestone, I need to hire this developer, I need to hire this digital marketing agency, I know what I'm doing, give me your money, right? Be confident that if you give me your money, I know what I'm doing. That's really what all this ends up being about, right? You should write that down, that's, that's just a perfect sentence to use. <laughs> you know what I'm doing, give me your money. Exactly. <laughs> and then of course, the second most important slide after the business model <coughs> is the ask. So how much is it, you know, what's the runway, what, what, what are the use of proceeds, and that's the slide that you, that you end on, right? Is, and again, being very clear and confident, even if you're not confident, <laughs> which nobody really is, you know? Fake it till you make it. When you're asking for <laughs> the money, it's just like, I'm raising this much money, this is a C round or a pre-seed round or whatever it is, um, this is what the money's going to be used for, and then these, you could even say, these, this is, and then this is the milestone it's gonna get us to. And the last one is just your contact information. So that's it. That's the Savvy Six and that's what's in the deck. And if uh, anybody would like to actually have a copy of this, I actually have this on my, on my website. You can go to fortunafunding.biz and download it for free. Um, this actually just runs through that what's in the deck uh, in us. So you have that as a PDF. Okay, all right. Great, thank you for your time. Yes.